-hmm. And Pat Robertson, mm -hmm. who I think he's still alive, in Virginia Beach, another yeah. very fundamentalist, very Christian yeah. um, uh, pastor who, uh, well, minister, I guess. Mm -hmm. I had a very, um, I learned a lot, uh, even, at, you know, I'm 61, but like when I was in high school, when I was middle school and high school, I experienced a lot of overt anti-Semitism and the neighborhoods I lived in, they were redlined and we knew like, no Jews or blacks allowed to live here. Yeah. And so our community, not surprisingly, was pretty uh, close and insular and pretty connected. Mm -hmm. And I just remember my parents always being like very involved in the community. Mm -hmm. And so I was really interested from an early age of like, what, what can we do like to make things better, not just for us as an individual, yeah. but like for our community. Yes. And what would it be like to have you know, to have friends that, you know, outside my, my insular community of Jewish community, like who are experiencing some of the things that I was experiencing, mm -hmm. you know, in this country, which is a Christian country, like when I used to raise my hand in middle school to answer a question, mm -hmm. some of the kids would like hiss and call me Christ killer. Yeah. So one of the stereotypes about Jews is, you know, we killed Christ. So yeah. Jesus Christ. So I kind of like grew up with like that curiosity, like that um, interest and drive. And then as I got more, you know, exposure to the world, mm -hmm. I never forget one day I was living in Washington, DC. I saw this great big billboard that talked about, um, violence against women and a battered women's shelter. And I was like, what is this about? Like I, yeah, I worked, I was working in a bank. I was a secretary in a bank. Mm -hmm. I'd had, you know, just a regular job. Just and so I, started learning more about like the history. So it's just curious. So I feel like I was kind of politically minded, civically minded, like thinking about how to make the world a better place beyond myself. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, what is this about? And so I just started learning more about the history of um, organizing communities that started really with the anti-rape movement in this country, like mm -hmm. literally like people opening up their basements and their church doors and yeah. saying, come be with us. And then I started learning more about like, how is that connected to um, what we used to call just the battered women's movement, the violence against women movement. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget sitting in the bank lunchroom, holding a book mm -hmm. that was something about the history of the movement of violence against women. And, a, and one of my bosses walked up to me and said, you know, women in those relationships, they're, they're masochistic. They're just asking for it. They like it. And I was like, you know, 20 something. I was like, uh, silent <laughs> I didn't say too much but that just kind of like sparked my actually kept my interest going and you know I didn't want to be a secretary in a bank forever but I wasn't sure what I wanted to do in life so I started volunteering at a YWCA back in Norfolk Virginia on their hotline and just hearing women's stories just hearing stories and just um finding that you know, finding that the power of just being there, just being there for people, just listening to people, mm -hmm. like how I didn't have to do anything fancy. Just yeah. being there was important. And from that, you know, I, then I eventually, I got a job working at the YWCA and then I worked in the shelter. I worked outside the, sh I worked in the community. We, I did like advocacy in the courts. Mm -hmm. I, did, I worked on really building relationships with attorneys that will provide services for free. And then when I came to Washington state, some gosh, 30 years ago now, <laughs> almost 30 years ago now, yeah. I started off, um, I had for a very short period of time, about 18 months, mm -hmm. a pay position in the prosecutor's office as mm -hmm. a advocate. So it gave yeah. me an idea of like what I learned a lot about the cops. I learned a lot about prosecutors and I learned, I didn't mm -hmm. like it. I didn't like it. I wanted to leave. I wanted to get back out in the community. Yeah. I didn't like being an arm of the criminal legal response. Yeah. And eventually I got, I volunteered. And eventually I got to the coalition, which has been my dream job because not only did we, you know, help folks, you know, we, we don't have folks coming directly to us. Like, mm -hmm. you know, as you know, at the direct service programs, but then we get to like impact laws, help change policies, mm -hmm. help get conversations going and community, like try to change, um, try to persuade people <laughs> that we all have a role 
Yes. They can't, domestic violence is complex, but we all have a role that we can play in preventing it and making things better for folks. So that was a long answer to your question. Oh, no, I like it. <laughs> I, I did not know that side about you. And yeah. I know why, what, you know why you joined this, this work. And it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it is amazing. And I think like growing up as a woman in this country, I, you know, very few women, I don't know, I, I don't know if I know any, I of course experienced sexual mm-hmm. harassment from <laughs> on the street to at a job. You know, I had a boss that used to walk by us and pop our bra straps, you know, rub our back and pop our bra straps and just like thought it was cute and funny, right? You know, it's 20 something. I didn't really know what to do. And I, I have not been a survivor of domestic violence in, in that I didn't have a relationship where I was in the long-term intimate relationship with someone who was causing harm. But I feel like the patriarchy and sexism and all the other structured forces are still there. So if you look on a spectrum, you know, I have, have had some exposure to what many women and, and other people in our culture have experienced living within patriarchy so homophobia and transphobia and all the in other ways so um it just you know i just don't feel like uh if you if you have any kind of awareness living in this country mm-hmm. you're going to ex- as a as a person who either identifies as a woman or who just doesn't doesn't fit the mold of of hetero you know straight up heteronormative cis behavior you're going to experience some form of patriarchy or and sexism and then I know the compounding impacts of like if you're a person of color if you don't speak the language if you're you know just I know all those things are a part of people's experiences so yeah oh yeah I know that one I was reminded today uh, when I was doing canvassing again and again and again and again you know when you are mm-hmm. a person of color and person who wear the headscarf and person who uh, speak differently and you know this country will remind you who you are every Mm -hmm. single day yeah I hope to see my friend wins it at the end but it's a long road but but I have seen some success also too but yeah 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 it's a long road and the grandmas are relying on the young people to keep being out there in the streets so thank you (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you are so thank you thank you you're, you're so welcome i was working with a young couple too like uh like my son's age and they were energetic and helping me out so I'm, i was good i was in a good head <laughs> i get to work a lot so my thighs are hurting right now so good ouch <laughs> no don't worry after this i'm gonna take a nap <clears throat> good let the family know be on notice Oh, I, I, I'm telling them I, they're not here right now. So, but I'm, 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 I'm taking my me time. So I'm good. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much for inviting me, Suad. I'm really feel quite honored oh to my be God. in this oh. group of women. Thanks. I do. Thank, thank, thank you very you. much. I'm grateful. Yeah, and that was your introduction, by the way. Uh, okay. Yeah. See. <laughs> You there you go. You, you know. No, you didn't even know you would give an introduction. So there you go. That was your introduction <laughs> and your bio at the same time. That's good. I like that. So um, I'm going to basically let you do most of the talking today. I'm sorry. I, I did hour and a half talking last night about healthy relationship in Somali language. And I think some of my sisters here listened to me last night. It was heated up. My sister is laughing at it. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was so good. Sad. Yeah. It was, <laughs> I'm sure it was. <laughs> hour and a half hour and a half I was like damn <laughs> but um so uh we're here to take today to talk about what is what is a healthy relationship looks like or what is her healthy relationship is so Leah um if you go first if you don't mind uh what is healthy relationship well uh, I think you know, I think that, um, and that's a broad question. When we yeah, it's a really big question. Family it could be couples. It could be, you know, and we can focus on like a intimate partners. Okay. Well, I think it's, it's funny you said that. Cause it's a lot of times what people say to me is like, how do I know if my relationship is okay or not mm-hmm. more than like, is it a help? Not too many people say to me, 
am I, you know, am I in a healthy relationship? What is a healthy relationship? I feel like sometimes I'm in these conversations when people are trying to check out what's going on for them. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like there's this one very scientific term. You could be in a crappy relationship, Mm -hmm. but it's not necessarily an abusive relationship. And of course, when I think about healthy, I kind of wish we had a different term. It sounds like eating vegetables, Yeah. but (laughs) What, it, what is it you, you hope for in a relationship and for yourself and for the, your loved one? And I guess if I think about it in the simplest terms, I feel like, do you have the freedom to make decisions for yourself mm-hmm. without any that are respected? Mm-hmm. Even, you know, we don't always agree, but do you have the freedom to make decisions that are respected without consequence sorry y'all that's that's our dogs barking in the background without consequence of any kind or other kinds of external control which could be you know um systems that you have to interact with that that uh are not going to be supportive unless you do things the way they think that you should do it Mm -hmm. so if we're just thinking about the individual the intimate relationship i think about like is it somebody who makes your world bigger Is it somebody that you can learn with and grow with? Or is it somebody who narrows your world, narrows your options? uh, And there's some kind of consequence if you resist. And it doesn't have to be physical or sexual. It could be like, I don't want you to be with your family because they never really liked me anyway. Or I don't want you to be with your sister. I don't want you to do that thing that I know that's important to you. Like, I don't want you to go canvassing. I don't want you to go talk on that radio show and gives you a lot of reasons like no. that makes you feel like you have to say no so to me kind of like in that range of what we hope for mm-hmm. you know I just want everybody I care about to be feel like that they're treated with kindness mm-hmm. respect mm-hmm. curiosity mm-hmm. compassion mm-hmm. sorry I gotta you know the space to space to fall and someone there to help pick you up. So that's what I, that's what I think about when you ask me that question. And I think within that, sometimes it's hard because people think about, and I mean, I certainly thought about this too, when I first started doing this work and I would listen to stories on the phone and I would think about my own relationships. You know, we can be in relationships that maybe we need to be in a different place or maybe they're not as they're not helping us live our best selves, but it doesn't mean that they're necessarily abusive. Maybe they're just in that kind of like crappy category or some other term that you feel comfortable with, but like, you know, not good, not good, not good for us, but, um, but not, a but not trapped in an abusive relationship in a different kind of way. So you know, I think that sometimes it's scary for people to think like, um, you know, if, if it isn't everything I want it to be, does this mean now that I'm, that I'm somehow made this terrible choice or something? And I just feel like, you know, it's, I, I didn't get to be in the relationship I am now the first time out the gate, right? So we're all learning and growing together and trying to figure out what's best for us. So be gentle on yourself while you're figuring that out. Um, ladies, this is conversation because I don't want to just to be uh, Lee and I talking. Um, you can, you know, chip, chip in and, you know, voice your opinion as well. Um, because I want it to make it like a conversational thing, not a lecture kind of thing. And your opinion also matters too. Um, and Leah, when you look for a partner, um, an ideal partner, um, and I know like uh, uh, you're a Jewish, I'm a Muslim, you know, our cultures are, are very similar. Um, what do we think of when we look for a partner or what do we, um, not think but what do we dream of having a partner a life partner 
Well, I mean, there's a lot that goes into that, right? There's, and I just want to say, we did get a good question in the chat, Suad, which we can come to, too. Yeah. Um, there's what you hope, what you imagine or hope for individually. There might be your, this certainly was something for me growing up, community expectations about who I would marry, what it meant to be a good Jewish wife, mm -hmm. a good Jewish part of Jewish community. Because I wasn't, I wasn't stepping outside of Jewish community. I was in Jewish community. Mm -hmm. So there's expectations there. And then, um, you know, kind of depending where you are in life, what you're exposed to, you know, do you, do you have any information beyond like, you know, what broadens your perspective? Sometimes it, it takes stepping away from your home a little bit, mm -hmm. but do you go from, you know, do you just go, go from being somebody's daughter to somebody's wife? It's hard to get that exposure, right? It's hard to even get another perspective or other information mm -hmm. in there. So again, what I, I certainly, what I hoped for um, in an ideal partner was being valued. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I had the words when I was younger of being an equal, but being valued, mm -hmm. being respected, being treated with kindness. Mm -hmm. I would say now being an equal partner yes and not expecting that that person would be my everything mm -hmm. um i'd want it i i really would want them to be my friend mm -hmm. which to me is um something i've certainly talked to my daughters about like could your the people the significant others in your life tell somebody else your favorite movies your mm -hmm. favorite song your favorite food to eat. Yes. Could they do that? Yeah. I mean, do you have a friendship like that where they know what makes you Happy. laugh, what you care about? Um, could they tell somebody else mm -hmm. your favorite, most comfy item of clothing, yeah. what you like Sunday morning for breakfast or mm -hmm. whatever time of whatever part of that week it is, you know, that yeah. friendship piece too. So I think that that, and then I think that, um, you know, within that, depending on uh, like what freedoms do you have within your, you know, like what freedoms did I have within my family and cultural mm -hmm. um, expectations? I mean, for me personally, I was able to get a little bit of freedom for that because mm -hmm. I didn't marry till later in life. Mm -hmm. I didn't marry until I was 30. Mm -hmm. So I think it would be a very different story. <laughs> and I had been proposed marriage to before then, but I was like, no. Yeah. And I was able to say no. Yeah. So I think it's, there's some different expectations, uh, different pressures that yeah. I was able to withstand uh, a lot better as I got older. Right. Yeah. Do we want to answer that person's question? Yeah, let's do it. How so, do you describe whether a partner is being controller? controlling or just to protecting you or protecting you mm -hmm. in sure. certain situations that is a great question well i think part of it is like your gut like mm -hmm. how does it feel to you yes does it feel like Protect like that person's being reasonable and they're listening to you and they're still concerned and they're concerned mm -hmm. and if you say, I appreciate your, you know, your own words, I appreciate your concern. I know you love me. I know you're worried about me. I feel okay about this. Mm -hmm. I would like to do this. I'll compromise with you about this, but yes. this is what I want to do. And your person is still, no, mm -hmm. you're not going to do that. And if you say, if you do continue to resist, what happens? That to me is one of those when I listen to stories from people in my neighborhood, people who, you know, when I used to work on the hotline and, and even now, I'm listening for what happens if you say no, however that looks, just resistance. Yeah. What happens? He's up arguing with me all night. I just, it's not worth it. I just give in. I'm exhausted. I'm the one who has to get up in the morning. I'm the one that has to make the breakfast or get the kids off or do whatever, put them on remote schooling. Mm -hmm. So I just give in, I'm exhausted mm -hmm. or 
well, then he's like, you can't have access to the internet for two days or two hours, Mm -hmm. or I'm going to tell your mother that you're not being a good wife. And then, you know, it's going to send your mom's blood pressure out the roof and you don't want him calling your mom and telling her anything. Exactly. So it's like, what happens if there's any kind of resistance? I think that's one of the ways that you can figure out, is this a controlling behavior? And you still may, and it's, you're still going to do what's best for you in the relationship. Mm -hmm. And if you have children, but like having some knowledge that like, actually, um, even if it's just for yourself, I'm making some choices Mm -hmm. to keep things as harmonious as possible in my family, but I'm not wrong. Yeah. I actually think my, this is just, this isn't really what I want to be doing. Mm -hmm. And that's, I'm just going to know that for myself. So that's, I think that's a beginning place to like, hang on to, you know, your truth. Yeah. True. So listening for that, what happens if there's resistance Yeah, is one way to kind of figure out what's going on. Mm -hmm. And sometimes uh, some of the um, protecting partner can be look protecting, but it also could be also controlling because uh, there's also manipulation with the protection. Right. Like I'm, I'm protecting you. I am trying to protect you from this. And, and, you know, your gut is telling you that there's nothing to be protected, but he's making you feel like, oh, you know, um, I got you, you know, but there's nothing to be gotten. Well, also your partner is going to know what's important to you. Yeah. What you value most. Mm -hmm. what you're interested in yeah right so they they have that information Mm -hmm. and that can be part of the reason why I'm saying the thing I'm saying or I'm doing the thing I'm doing Mm -hmm. right so I see yes T T says exactly Mm -hmm. so they're gonna know Mm -hmm. um you know the behaviors that they're gonna use to control you are gonna be unique to you Mm -hmm. or unique to your situation as a couple and they know you best Mm -hmm. and guess what you know you best too you're an expert on your life too of course right Mm -hmm. yeah that's that's the i just think it's helpful to have some some clarity and like some belief in yourself like even if doesn't you know us having this discussion obviously doesn't mean anybody has to do anything I hope nobody feels there's any expectation or judgment. It's just helpful to have clarity about like your own thinking and that like, you know, this is what I thought it was. He just didn't want me to do it. Yeah. He just didn't want me to do it. I want to do it. (laughs) And he's giving me a lot of fancy reasons, but Mm. he doesn't want me to do it. Yeah. So it's just helpful to be like, I'm not crazy. (laughs) That's what I wanted to do. Exactly. just didn't want me to mm-hmm. and maybe there's another way to help you get what you want and need through you know supportive friends mm-hmm. however you might negotiate and navigate in your relationship of course i think would it also kind of be just like if that comes up really like addressing that with him being like you know i know I guess more of a confrontation kind of thing. Like, you know, I know this is what you're doing, but so you need to stop, like, you know, because I know what I want kind of thing. Because I I feel like sometimes we kind of just go gloss over it and be like, okay, he only wants the best for me. But if you actually confront it head on, that might actually put a stop to it for for him doing it in the future again. Like, you know, if I say this, she'll just do that. But really knowing, okay, I know what you're doing. Just stop it sort of thing. Do you know what I'm saying? Yes. I Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that... um every person's different. So like that confrontation piece, you may have a gut feeling that I can't say that. I'm not sure what would happen if I was that direct, or it may be like you saying some version of, I know what, I get what you're doing, but this is just really what I want to do. And I want you to hear me. And it's important to me. And I know you want to support 
what's important to me. So I really want you to hear this. I think it's totally worth, I mean, that's a part of like not having people read our minds, communicating what we care about, sharing with that. I just, I do think that's really important. And that's, that could be like, you're just, you're in a relationship where that person just needs to hear that doesn't mean something worse is going to happen. Mm -hmm. But I also, I also just put out there that like, I also feel like if somebody feels like hearing us say this, like, not sure how that would go. I respect that and be like, you know, trust your gut. Maybe you have to go, you have to try it a little bit. Like I, you have to go easier, whatever that might look like. Like, this is important to me. I really want you to hear, hear me and see how that goes, you know, before yeah. you say, Hey, cut it out, knock it off. Mm -hmm. So everybody's different. I mean, Every really, you know, so that's part of this conversation is like some people are trying, I assume some people are trying to figure out like, is this my person just being like, you know, difficult, not listening, used to being in charge mm -hmm. and he's, he's going to have a growth opportunity or is my person when I do push back or mm -hmm. say no, actually make things even harder. Yeah. So you're trying to negotiate that and figure that out. So I think uh, all of that is true for people. And it doesn't mean we don't want people to have what they want and need. It's just like, uh, we want people to be, uh, we want folks to be as safe as they can. And if it's little baby steps you need to take, it's little baby steps yeah. while you're trying to figure out what you want and need. You're welcome. Um, how do um, how do women know when there is control in place, uh, but in the same time, it seems like there's so much love that he's given, but it's not love, but it's in the same time, it's like a control. And this question came out last night too. Uh, it's, it goes back to the manipulation, you know, like uh, to manipulate his mm -hmm. love for her. But in the same time, it seems like, a, uh, you, you know, you and I both seen, you know, power of control, uh, but also he's the, you know, protector, the maintainer, everything, but everybody else sees it that's around her, but except her. How, how would you see, how would you see it? Well, she may see it. Or well, she's already have seen it, but she doesn't want us to see it. Or she may know, right? Um, I just think part of it is you have to believe well, I think there's a lot that goes into what you just said. Mm -hmm. um, some of it is like, you have to believe that you're gonna have, okay, first of all, you may love your partner and that a lot of what you experience is positive in terms of the relationship, in terms of kids, family, community, like, maybe, you know, 80% of it's positive, mm -hmm. but it's this 10, 20% that's really hard when you, when you don't agree or you're trying to do something differently or go or learn something differently or expand or just, just do something that you haven't done before, mm -hmm. a place of disagreement. And um, And their consequences may be for you or maybe the consequences towards the kids or other folks. It's like, it's just kind of, you just kind of, I don't know what the stakes are because again, if, if the person, like if you're describing someone and your example, that's like really loving and is saying everything that they're doing is out of love and that they do share, do express a lot of love. It's, it is hard and it is difficult when you get to that 20% where it's like, 
but I really want to have a driver's license or I really want to go back to school or I really want to, you know, join this book club. I, I mean, whatever it is, that's the, that's the thing. Or I really want to be more involved with the kids this way. Whatever it is, is the thing. Um, if you find that pushing back, saying no, resisting in any way means that you suffer some kind of consequence or harm or penalty or something's taken away from you that you wanted like time with family or time with friends then it's like then it's difficult to like how do I balance these two when like there's all, all these other good parts about this person as well and when and if you if other people around you see it I mean I just think it's very rare that that person might not think that somehow or worry that somehow other people are like already judging her or judging their relationship mm -hmm. I mean I just feel like in people's heart of hearts they kind of know if everybody around them is like a little worried or they know something mm -hmm. but they may feel like they need to defend their partner or protective of their partner because they're weighing lots of things. Maybe this part, maybe they, you know, we don't know all the things they need them for. You know, we've talked about this a lot. It could be everything from like, uh, I love this. I love where we live. I love my community of friends. I love the school my kids in. I don't want to disrupt any of this. Mm -hmm. I don't speak English that well. I need them for this part, this thing. I want, I, you know, I'm afraid of this thing. I need them for that. Like, what are those things? What are those trade-offs that have to do with, or what are the things that person's thinking about that have to do with individually what impacts their life and their relationship, but then the larger world, the community you live in, like you just said, what you experience every day, just from wearing your headscarf, like all that, it just weighs on you. And that's things you're considering too. So and then just thinking about like, well, will whatever I do, will things be better mm -hmm. or worse? Or I don't know. So that even the I don't know is, is, is hard. So I think it's like, I just think that like that, would I, if I was a friend of that person I was worried about, I would be like, how are things going? Mm -hmm. And are, are you, how are things going or, and are you getting the things that you want and you need? And, you know, my version of that or your version of that. And like, what's, what's most worrying to you or what keeps you up at night or what do you, what would you like? What's your, what's the most important thing to you? Like just trying to find a way in to connect because, you know, there's so much hopes and dreams and grief mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> tied in our relationships, right? And especially if we have children together, we're building a life together and we're part of community and it's not just by yourself. I don't know if I answered your question that well, but. Oh, oh, oh yeah, you did. I have a woman who um, called me this morning after I had that talk last night and she said, I have seven children and my husband is abusive, but I don't want to divorce him uh, because she said, I don't speak the language. I don't know how to write and read. Man, I don't want to move where I live. I, I have seven children, she said. She yeah. keeps repeating, I have seven kids. I am 48. Um, I don't want to bring another man into their life it's that this is their father i hear what you said last night and i admire you and i wish i could have done all of those i wish i was that strong woman that you know you are but that's not the reality for me she said and even though divorce is permissible in our religion, I don't want it to be divorced because I'm scared 
to be alone. And I don't want my children to grow up without a father. So I, I, I just prefer to stay married to this guy, even though I know he's my abuser. That's heavy. It's a lot. Yeah. I mean, that's where I feel like community can be helpful. So I feel like if there's, if there was anybody in her life that he respects, anybody in their community that he respects, I mean, this is something that like, I feel like we can, we explore, we explore with our friends. And that like, if she was sitting beside you to be like, is there anybody in the community or anybody among our friends and family that could basically say to you, you know, you need to knock it off or cherish your wife or love her or like whatever that version is, but like somebody that they would respect to say like, I'm worried about you. I care about you. I care about your wife. I care about your family. We want you all to be happy. It, it seems like there's some, some trouble or sadness or whatever that is, but to show like care for that person causing harm, they're not like being kicked out of the community, but also communicated that like that they're not taking care of their family in the best way that they could. So I'm just want, you know, in that situation, I would just wouldn't want her to be left alone with it. If, if it was acceptable to her, if she thought there was somebody that he would listen to, hopefully there is you know, a friend, anyone, but like, so that he knows other people are paying attention to their life and their family and what's happening and that he's cared for, that they're not saying, we don't want you around anymore. We want you to do better. I mean, I just, I just feel like we need to come up with more, more alternatives. And that's, I feel like this, this time that we're living in right now with the focus on community care and more community solutions and let's get away from using systems. Like this is the time to keep once again, to probably lean on, maybe there was a granny, maybe there was a grandma that could say, knock it off. You know? Yeah. yeah. But like to lean on other, to, to try to think of other ways to support people so that they're not alone, that she's just not thinking, okay, 48, she's got a lot of years left, thinking that she has to be alone in this and that maybe things could be better. It's not going to be perfect, but maybe things could be better for her. And I, I don't have the answer, but that at all, but I would be um, hopefully like the community the Somali family task force. And I know, um, I think about Project Devorah, Jewish Family Services, they have a advocate that works in the Orthodox community and they're facing some of the, some so similar kind of challenges where people are like lots of kids, lots of reasons to be together, but they would like life to be better, right? And she's got even more like just the language, like in that example alone. Um, what if the abuse escalates because she sought out a mediator? That's a good question. So she would be, um, I think that kind of, I think Sahara, you're right. You have to think it through with the person. So to say, okay, is there somebody in your life you think your husband respects? Okay. He respects his brother. He literally looks up to his brother. All right. What do you think would happen? Like talk it through with people. Let's go pro and con about this like okay let's say he talks to his brother and he says everything's fine with the brother but he's really actually mad mad that you told somebody about it before they have that conversation let's prepare for it you know he's going to be talking to his brother what would be a good place for you to be with the kids or would it be good to have mom come over or would it be good to have my sister come over like just kind of think through the what ifs and she may even say, you know, it's not a good idea for the brother to come. Oh, she doesn't live in Washington state. So yeah, well, whoever it is, but the, the point is like to talk it through, to say like, let's have a plan. Let's have an emotional plan. You know, let's say they have it. Let's have a plan that thinking about your literal safety. Let's have a plan thinking about the kid's safety. Let's just talk it through. It's just, just to, and at the end of that conversation, she may say, I don't know if that was such a good suggestion. Let me think about it some more. Now that we've talked through what will it be like when he comes, 
back home or what would it be like after that conversation or yeah I live alone I live in another state mom can't be here you know let's think about it so it's it, it may not be the first conversation you figure it all out but I definitely would think through what could be the possible his possible reactions that's part that's if you know you're living with somebody who's causing harm and abuse you definitely want to plan for their possible reactions and that is a part of what we like to call safer planning because you know it's fluid and things change but you do want to think through what can my partner's reaction be to taking this step because it's not a neutral environment it's a really good question sorry because it's not a neutral environment anything the person does mm -hmm. they should be thinking through what the par partner's possible reactions could be so that they do their to, to the best that we can support folks we help them think through how to protect themselves and their kids. Mm -hmm. And to answer your question, Zahra, yes, she sought out mediator before. She sought out help for her marriage. She sought out uh, even court protection order, um, everything. And, um, but this guy keep coming back and she decided to just stay with him and just accept it. She said, this is my destiny. Mm -hmm. And I am going to, you know, just accept it. And she said, I've made acceptance and I prayed on it and I'm going to live with it. You know, then that person, that may be what, what it is for them. But I tell you, just not giving up on them because people get frustrated and tired with people who are accepting things. They want I, them to do something. Yes. So just hanging in there and staying connected is so powerful. Yeah, I, I, I tell her, you know, the lines are open for her. She yeah. can call me anytime. Because maybe a year from now, she'll be like, well, I'm done. I, my kids are now old enough, or I want to learn English. I want to take an ESL class. Yeah. Or oh, no, I want to encourage you know. her to, 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 to not focus on him, more to focus on herself. Yeah, or I'm more <laughs> happy. Yeah. Even though he's still the same, I have, you know, my girlfriends and I, we get together two nights a week to hang out and drink hot beverages till we get sleepy. You know, we've yeah. got, I've got more people in my life. I'm not just with him. Like mm -hmm. you never know like what that thing will be, but I have talked to family members who are like, I'm just frustrated. I'm done. They won't do what I think they need to do. Mm -hmm. And I think like, yeah, I think I saw in the, in the um, comments, I think it was Zahara again, said something about a contingency plan. Yeah, I think like, just, just keeping in mind, if you know your friend or someone you love or care about is in a course of an abusive relationship, to, uh, to just realize any step is not neutral and mm -hmm. to always think through like, what could the possible with the person, because they'll be expert on their relationship yeah. What could the possible possible reactions be? And let's just try to let's try to get ahead and think about it. Yeah, true. Any common ladies? We're talking about healthy relationship. How do you know your relationship is healthy? Hi, everybody. I have a I don't have a question, but I um, I just want to see what the expert says. Um, like, for example, if your um, family went through, especially um, sister or, or cousins, um, and saying that, I mean, they telling you, oh, this is what's going on. This is how the abuse are. And this is, and then for me, my, the way I felt is I don't want to hear it because he's doing this and those, you should run away. You should do this. You should do this. So I don't know how else to, um to um respond and i don't i don't want it her to shut it down so what what am i supposed to do what is because listening every day and then i was like am i giving her advice but it's not like just the situation you guys were talking about not the person that they don't want to move on they just want to stick by and it's but it's for me for me i feel like it's easy for me to just say to her you know what leave it why do you want to take this? You can do this. You can do that. Um, you know, you, you yawn, you this, but it's not me. It's not me. So how can I, 
more open to this? How can I, as, as Suad says that she's open the, the line and all that, I, for me, it's hard for me to do that. So how can I be chill out and wait until, I mean, just wait and listen to the person and once they ready, they might do the action they need to work for them. So. You, you, you really said the answer. I know you, I know you know the answer. I know you know it. You said it so beautifully. You know, you're, you're right. It's so hard when you love somebody to keep hearing the same thing and to keep hearing them being harmed. I mean, I've totally been there. My family, I got a big family. Mm -hmm. I've have extended family members where we've had these conversations and just know that being a lifeline, being a person who they, who your family member feels like they can still talk to without judgment, mm -hmm. even though you may have like this uh, conversation going on in your head, that's like, oh my gosh, this is so hard to hear. Yeah. But just to know that like you're listening without judgment and and being there is so powerful. Please don't underestimate mm -hmm. how powerful that is. Yep. And that you do, you know, I'm sure you do have information and resources and you probably can gain more over time. And there will be a moment where you could maybe drop a tiny something, mm -hmm. a little bit of information or not. And you don't know when that's going to be because you don't, as you can imagine, like how much is invested in the relationship for the person emotionally, mm -hmm. the family, do they have kids? Like all these things we've been talking about, right? Like you, we don't know where, the, even if they don't have children, just their hopes and dreams of what this relationship, this marriage could have been or what this relationship could have been. There's grief in that, like just losing your hope of what it could have, what it could have been and what it meant for you. So I just think it's like, be gentle with yourself. It's hard. Mm -hmm. It's hard when you care about people. Yep. And just know that your listening really matters. It does. And it's, it's, you won't be able to predict it. So, I mean, I'm sure Suai can give you information. You probably found stuff by yourself as well, but like, just if, if, and when you're asked for anything, you, you know, having more at your having more information available will help you feel more confident and like knowing a little bit more about like what services really are like might be helpful because people have ideas like sometimes like, oh, you have to get divorced before you can get help or you have to go to a shelter or you have to do this or do that. It's so like just having some accurate information about that might make you feel more and more comfortable if you get a chance to talk about that stuff. But um, I just think staying with, I want you to have the things that you care, like in your own words, I want you deserve to have what you care about. I want you to have what you want and need. I want you to be happy. I want you to be treated with respect and kindness. I want that for you. You deserve that, just your version of it. And then you, and then you, it would be helpful for you to have somebody to talk to, to say like, ah, oh, it's so hard. It's so hard when I have to hear this again for the 68th time. Yeah, that might be helpful for you too. But you're doing all the right things. Yep. I, I came in. Um, I came in a little bit late. But is it is it normal like um, if somebody go into an abuser and they go forward a little bit and then sit back five times back where they used to be? Is it normal for the person who's going through the? Is that something normal that they you think they're making a progress and they going forward and you saying yeah okay they are now at least they are taking some steps. And then five, they went back to again where they left it month and a month ago. Is that something normal that person that goes through? I mean, I, Sua, did you wanna say something or? Isn't that the, the cycle of, um, what is it called? Well, I, I mean, they, they used to call it the cycle of abuse, but, I really, but really we, what we kind of learned, which is not gonna be surprising to you to hear mm -hmm. is that people are testing things out. Mm -hmm. And they're trying something and they're like, okay, this person said that they would do X, mm -hmm. Y, and Z. I'm going to give it a chance. I'm going to try. Yep. And then I'm going to have to see, I mean, I'm depending on what's going on in that person's life. Cause again, every situation is going to be unique to the people involved. The person causing har the harm 
knows what's important to their person, knows their values, what they care about. They can use that as a way to keep people in the relationship because they want their person to stay in the relationship. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I don't know, like the person you care about, they're going to like try it, see what happens. And so from the outside, it could look like, as you said, oh, we made some progress, but now you're back where you were before. Mm -hmm. Because the person who's like the target of the harm is just trying to check things out and see, can, can this change really be better? Can you do the thing you say you're doing? And then sometimes I would think like, if it's failed, are they blaming themselves? Do they feel like, oh, if I'd only tried this, done this or that, maybe it would have worked. Like there could be some self-blame and some judgment wrapped up in it too. And so then it's, or embarrassment, or everyone's going to think, or, you know, look at, you know, fearing judgment from others. Shame. Like, yeah. Being ashamed. Like, I'm not stupid. Why is this happening? Did I, is it, is it who I picked? Is it, you know, just, there can be a lot of negative um, self-talk. And, you know, in this country, I feel like sometimes women are damned if they do and damned if they don't. You know, we're told families, everybody needs to, you know, families need two partners, families need the mom and dad. And then they also say to women, well, if you're in an abusive situation, why don't you leave? You know, so it's just like, well, what do you want here? You know, yep. so there's a lot of, um, I feel like there's a lot of pressure on um, women in terms of like the choices they're making, so much judgment they're getting. And then how much is that internalized too? Like, so then you got to climb out of that again and test the waters and see um, what step you might take again. So, but what the thing that I always try to keep in mind, because when I used to do direct service and maybe you've had this experience too, Suad, is even I talked to a woman who had like been back several times in the relationship, left, came back, left. She had a little bit more information. Mm -hmm. She had a little bit different perspective. She had a little bit more we could build, we could reference and talk about and be like remember that thing remember what you told me remember you you told me you wanted you know so so it's not like the person is totally untouched by the experience yeah. and so you're that person in her life that she's talking to you're one of the people she's getting support from you you could probably you would be able to reflect back moments of strength mm -hmm. moments of creativity even yeah. at her lowest right Yes. moments of resourcefulness you'll be able to do that because you have a little distance and being able to reflect back to that for people sometimes you might be the first person in a long time who mm -hmm. said even after she's like everyone's like oh she's back again blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. you notice that thing she did and you can remind her of that mm -hmm. that moment of beauty that moment of strength mm -hmm. or creativity does that make sense you just remind her, you know, you're just that, um, you're just that a constant reminder for her. And also you're that rock that she keeps it or that, you know, phone call that she looks forward to or that friend that she feels confident, you know, to go to or cousin, you know, that she can speak to. Because if you close that line, and you get tired of it and you close that line you will be wonder for the rest of your life mm. what if and then she might do something crazy you know and then you'll be blaming yourself if she if something bad happens you know to her or god forbid you know something tragic happens you know so the reason why you want to keep those lines open is not for you, it's for her. Just to. You know, and is it Zainab? Zainab? How do I say that? Zainab. Oh, Zainab, thank yes, you. Yes, Zainab. Yep. And Zainab, you can call me Leg because of my misspelling every time I get anybody's <laughs> name wrong. <laughs> I, I think you, you know, your comment too about the effect on the children and very hard for loved ones to watch it all unfold. Yeah. I mean, I think again, like that's a place where having family and community to be like, to just be a witness for kids to be like, this is hard. And, you know, I, I'm sure like 
depending on the children's age to be like age appropriate to like be there for them yeah. and talk with them or talk about what they're I mean I really feel like kids can starting pretty young can you know just being able to share their feelings and their worries just you being an adult in their life that's witnessing their pain and witnessing what's happening for them is is incredibly powerful and is very protective I mean your common sense tells you, but there's all this research that will back you up too, that it's very, very powerful just to have caring adults that are protective and acknowledging the reality and being there where kids are, wherever they're at, like, just like, it's hard to see mommy or daddy upset, or it's hard to hear, you know, it's hard to see sadness, hard to hear loud, what, whatever you think would be the age appropriate, but like, but the kids hear things even if they can't see things yeah kids sense things and that doesn't mean every child who's been exposed to Mm -hmm. abuse and coercion is a going to grow up to be someone who's abusive or b going to grow up to be somebody who's a victim Mm -hmm. the witnessing the caring of adults other people there that love you that's i feel like where community can be so powerful and I say community like to, to include our network of friends too, that that's, that is our chosen family mm-hmm. um, can do a lot. It's, it's really makes a difference. I, I'll never forget a story a woman told me um, who grew up in a very abusive home. Unfortunately, her family, like her mother experienced a lot of very extreme physical abuse. But what one thing her mother, two things that were really powerful for her is the school she went to <clears throat> she had a teacher that would just talk to her, let her hang out in her room every day for as long, you know, after school to do her homework, whatever. And also her mom used to draw a smiley face on the brown paper bag of her lunch bag every day. And she said, you know, if, if, if somebody called Ch- Child Protective Services, they probably would have taken me out of there. And that would have been the worst thing that would have happened to me. I would have been so upset to be separated from my mother. I, that would have been more traumatic than knowing what my, watching what my mother was going through, not being there and not being able to be with her. But that smiley face on the brown paper bag and the teacher that let me just hang out in the space got me through. So it's like, just know, if you are a person in someone's life where, you know, just being that witness and being there to connect with kids or family, like just to know that that's really powerful and can make such a, I never forgot that story, you know, can make such a difference because I bet, you know, if somebody had known about it, she said they would have definitely pulled her out of that house Mm -hmm. and that would have been worse. She said, I probably would have committed suicide being so worried about my mother. I wanted to be there. I wanted to, I wanted to be there for my mom. So taking me away would have made it worse. So it's just, it is really hard and your care and your showing up is really matters. It does. Even when we can't like fix it the way we want to fix it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we can't fix it. We just have to show up. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. It sounds like what I'm hearing at times, we just need to boy harm reduction mm-hmm. methods yes, we may, not, we may yes, not be doctor. able to yeah yeah borrowing from our some of our clinical interventions is is literally harm reduction whenever we are unable to to make definitive changes mm-hmm. um, because I, I i can say for sure psychosocial stresses are real using the case example as seven children no uh, language barriers not a uh, professional living in, I don't know, is she in Washington state, whichever state in the United States, it is, it is hard. So it's sometimes choosing uh, the lesser of two evils or the, the, e- the evil that you know, rather than the unknown. Absolutely. Um, because I can, I can't imagine if somebody had to be in the uh, system, the shelter system or out on the streets, if you don't have a definitive um, contingency plan where you know somebody else will take seven of your kids under the roof, continue school, all of that. Um, it is is it it's uh, easier said than done. And it's and incredibly think, traumatic for the family to have children removed. Yes, 
Yeah. So, but if at least we can do, we can focus on harm reduction, making sure the uh, there's no domestic violence or reducing, you know, the 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 interactions or anything that would incite the abuser to to be abusive. Mm-hmm. Uh, at least, if nothing else, not physically. Um, and 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 if we could uh, uh, strengthen our ability to kind of deflect emotional abuse, mm-hmm. because if you're gonna have to be stuck somewhere you know, trying to deflect mm-hmm. that and maybe uh, doing whatever we can protecting the children, like in the case of, you know, that smiley bag or s- staying away from home as much as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, but but the struggle is real. So Zahra, Zahra, thank you for saying that. I mean, one of the things we talk a lot about with families and we've talked, uh, Suad knows we talk a lot about this with home visitors is, yes, the goal is to reduce coercion mm-hmm. and abuse. That's the priority. And yep. so working with the family is the best way to, to, you know, working with the person who's the target of the harm or the, is the, they're usually the expert on what will, will make things better. And, you know, when you're thinking about that, of course, you're thinking about children too. And like even making the person causing harm a better caretaker, a better parent yep. can be better for mm-hmm. the whole family. Like yeah. at, like asking, you know, talking with them about like, what kind of, memories you want to leave your children what kind of father do you want to be what do you want your legacy to be you know just to like that way to engage um dads to be even being a better dad Mm -hmm. is going to make everything better in the family so yeah yeah because the heart you know we've got to have more more options and more solutions than just relying on the systems which are actually failing us and causing more harm Mm -hmm. so i'm not going to make it sound for us prettier you know than it is yeah. so, as, as long as they're not malignant unempathic human beings that cannot there's no way in hell you could <laughs> yeah and i mean right I mean, narcissist <laughs> right that right there's fair but there but that's the thing is like you know we've got pop culture and media that mm-hmm. hold up for us like really extreme mm-hmm. images of domestic violence right and yes. you see in the paper and stuff a lot of people are in the relationships where there's a lot of harm happening that is not that extreme. Still harm, still not what we want for people. Still not what we want for our children, but they're not, you know, living with a sociopath. Mm-hmm. They're living with somebody that maybe like, I don't know, 70% of the time is okay. But yeah. that 30% is really difficult, you know? Mm-hmm. So yeah. maybe they play really well with the kids and they remember the birthdays and they're a good provider, but they're too harsh in their discipline of the children. Yes. Or they are too, they don't let, you know, let you, the mom, you know, be with your friends or, yeah. but 70% of the time, it's not so bad. So it's not what we want for people, but that's what we mean about like, how can we help look yeah. for those little nooks and crannies opportunities to build what people want and mm-hmm. latch on to like the things they say that they care about to help them have the freedom to live and love freely you know mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so thank you for saying that yeah yeah absolutely and i guess it just maybe it may be just in a, enough time to it, it'll allow them to time to to develop the courage and and uh, acquire the resources to leave in in the in the case where you know what it's, it's just never gonna things aren't gonna change to the point that you 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 want them to expect them to 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 feel like you're in a nourishing relationship mm-hmm. um so harm you know harm reduction until hopefully there's a cure <laughs> well yeah, yeah because like you can, clinically yep yeah if you think of of suad's example what would it take for someone who doesn't feel literate in English mm-hmm. with seven children is probably dependent financially on this other person? I mean, maybe it takes him just living with somebody else in the community and leaving her and not living with her. I mean, you know, yeah. you know, we'll stay with if, the brother. <laughs> right. Stay with the brother. And that's yeah. will make her life a lot better because she's yeah. not going to be able like until everybody goes to school when is she going to go to school you know it's just like what's the reality what are we asking of people like we don't want to ask the families the impossible so Get really ask a lawyer them. if you can pro bono make sure he pays that rent or pays that children bill children's bill in the meantime 
get that support to to hold that person accountable. Sometimes it's just and and again, I'll revert back to narcissists. Like their image is so huge. So I feel like if you're gonna expose them, they will whip into shape at least to ensure that you don't or somebody doesn't expose them. Yeah. So sometimes you have to. And that's the thing that and you get would, yourself a therapist. Yeah, yeah. Actually, therapists could be really helpful. But that's the thing you would want to ask the person in that relationship who's the target of the harm. Will this make things? You think this would make this person? behave better because he's afraid of outside judgment or do you think it would make it harder for you so you know we you want to ask and just ask the person you you just want to be direct and ask the person what they think because they'll know yeah um you know i remember one time a while back there was a lady that uh, i was working with uh i was not working with i was working with her niece and she told me and she said my husband used to be a, 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 she said, I was a domestic violent relationship. She said, I did not leave him until my daughter, my older daughter, daughter went to school and graduate and she moved to college dorm. And she said, in her graduation date, she told me, mom, come with me, leave dad. I will help you to raise my brothers and sisters because mm. you don't need my dad anymore mm. she said she helped me she helped my life she saved my life this was a long time ago i just throw, i just remember while you guys were talking and this uh someone mom this mom was so just remind me of that relationship and she said that my daughter helped me get away from him i this mean woman is, for all this year until her daughter graduate college to leave this guy to yeah but here but i think your example is a beautiful example of one of the things we hear from survivors so much that one of the biggest reasons for either returning or staying in a relationship that's harmful is lack of affordable housing yeah. Definitely. So in your situation, the daughter is able to say, come be with in that example, come be with me. So it's more than housing, you know, her daughter, her, her love, she'll have support, she'll have understanding, helping to raise the children. But, you know, same thing for the woman with seven kids. Like, where is she? I don't care. Even if she's okay. So I definitely still work with, I still have survivors in my life that are from this country, speak English, can mm -hmm. work, yeah. and they have children who are not in school yet and it's very difficult to find housing to on your own oh right to, to to be able to afford like there's one family i'm thinking of right now she has five kids and she, you know it's she's living in subsidized housing on a budget that i don't even know how she's making it because one of her children has a disability so she can't go to work yet she's gonna have to wait till he's in a kind of a program, but I'm thinking to myself, even when she goes to work, how is she going to afford child care? You know, you know, all the barriers, right? So oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. economic barriers are huge for folks when they're thinking about these decisions, let alone how you feel emotionally, community connection, family connection, the economic barriers are real. And one of the things that we can say in Washington state and a number of our programs and so I can tell folks more about it. It's like a number of our programs have um, financial housing assistance money, especially after COVID mm. too, there's more money in our state, but yes, it is. you know, but it's, it's, it's a, I know it's a piece of the puzzle, but it is an important piece. Mm -hmm. the, ec the economic realities are, are huge barriers for folks too. It is. And Actually, that's globally because I had a college roommate who we at Smith College, which is considered an elite institution. And he, she mentioned she's from Zambia, and she said her mother chose not to leave her husband, abusive husband, because one, she knew he would not pay their her children's school fees, and she wanted to ensure that her children were educated. And and yes, indeed, they were. They she became very su successful, went and worked as an investment banker, Lehman Brothers. But meanwhile, the mom was also, while she was in that uh, relationship, also worked on her own um, economic independence, starting a business. 
mm. on the side while she ensured her husband still continued to support her oh. children until basically they had economic freedom. And, and this is a global phenomenon. Mm, um, yeah. Granted, there are some women who still choose, I guess it depends on the level of quote unquote abuse, again, what they will tolerate yes. uh, to stay despite financial. Um, but it's, I think or one of the biggest factors is, is economics. Or like not everybody is can start a successful business. And, you know, we don't know, we don't know what, I always feel a little careful about like what people will tolerate or choose because we don't know everything, you know, like we don't know what's under the water, right? We don't know everything that people are dealing with. Yes. Um, but economic is different. Economic, um, de- economic de- oh, money may money matters. Money, <laughs> money really matters. Money matters. Yes. <laughs> money really matters. And it's a it's a big barrier. Yes, mm-hmm. it's a barrier for women, period. Yeah. It's I mean it still is like so if we just think about the system, mm-hmm. we still make we still make a portion of what men make, you know, yeah. so white women make more, women of color make less, you know, there's just all, still all these systemic barriers that really do impact our ability to earn money. Um, you know, if you're pregnant and then you step mm-hmm. out of the workforce and you come back in, just like all those things that childcare is not government is not supported by the government in this country, mm-hmm. our healthcare access, reproductive healthcare access, like taking care of our bodies. We don't have the same kind of support, no. blah, blah. So there's definitely, um, it's not just about the individual choices and barriers, but like what is around us for support in our communities and our cities that actually um, make a difference in those decisions about what you're going to do. I I, I think, I think um, I have a, I have a um, friend of mine who's going through the same thing. Her daughter is in the college now. And then when we, when you were just saying that we don't know anything and anything's going on, um, the daughter says that yes mom come out and then when the when the dad noticed that mom is getting a lot of uh, uh, encouragement for her daughter and saying that you know mom i'm gonna work i'm gonna make more money don't worry about it the dad decided not to bring her back to home when she finished in college he said don't bring her out of home uh, and the mom is like oh no now she's she was like oh let's not do this because she has a, another five kids at home and this one now in the college, and he's saying that don't bring her because he noticed that that uh, mom is getting a little bit a uh, little bit advice for daughter and says that you know when she go out, daughter went out and get all this information and says that you know what mom you can do this, we can go this, you can do this, all that, and the dad says you know what, let her tell tell you tell her she cannot come home when she finishes school or even when she has the, I mean time off and from college she can't come home. You know, it is hard, and then it's just uh, sometimes the abuser knows that where the th- when mom is changing and getting some uh, maybe information and getting some ideas and uh, having that on, but it still doesn't want to leave. It still doesn't. She wants to stay more. I mean, it's just right. uh, it's hard for the kids too. Right. So he's trying to interrupt <clears throat> the support or information that she's getting from his the daughter. Mm-hmm. yeah so sounds so it sounds like though i bet daughter and mom will still try to figure out how to continue to like you know once that you, you you've kind of opened that package right i i bet the daughter and mom at least i hope they still continue to talk yep and continue how to keep getting information to her it may take a little longer because now that dad, dad, dad has figured something out but mm-hmm. um yeah. I'm hoping that connection will still still the happen. Daughter, the daughter says that she will never gonna leave her mom. Uh, she's like, I'm not even gonna get married. I'm not gonna go anywhere. I will mm-hmm. stay until you kick my dad at home because it's not gonna go. And then and then the dad realized that he, he kind of getting that and he was he's now is advocated even calling us and telling us, you know what? My house will be better if this young lady was not gonna come back. Because there are so many things going on that she's doing, even when she's at the college. I was like, what? Mm-hmm. And the mom says that she's not doing anything that she was doing it because of what's going on. Now it's out there and he doesn't mm-hmm. want that. So. Yeah, well, that's, it's good that the rest of the family is kind of figuring him out because they can, 
just keep supporting daughter and mom in the, mm -hmm. in the way that, um, need it to be way it needs to be. And maybe make sure, try to keep dad from knowing anything dad doesn't need to know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, since you all have his number, you like know what's happening. You could be yeah. like nodding your head and still planning behind closed doors. Yep. He doesn't need to know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Daughter, so keep, keep keep him in the dark <laughs> yeah that's tough though that's tough because you know tough. yeah it is tough you know abusers they always find a way to manipulate things uh especially relationship uh, loved ones so that's his daughter for god's sake uh yeah anyway so um expectation community freedom value Respect to friendship. Um, yeah, I mean, healthy relationships, it's uh, not easy to keep and to maintain. One of the things that came out last night was that how to maintain a healthy relationship. And this is the last question I'm going to ask you. I was asked, I answered my question in Somali. I wanna ask you how to maintain a healthy relationship. Well, I think we have, let's see, how many people are here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight, you and me, 10. I've got eight people here who know how to answer that question. Mm -hmm. So guys, I mean, how do you maintain healthy relationship? As you should agree, I want to know too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you all know. I mean, you know, um, patience with yourself. Mm -hmm. um, willingness to learn new things. Compromise. And you know, same thing from the other, everything we're saying, we hope the other person in your relationship will have it. Yeah. Willingness to learn new things, curiosity. Yes. Uh, being curious about the other person. Self-respect. Uh, Self-respect, but also friendship. Oh, friendship, that's my- I think friendship is like trying to do some things outside of the obligation of whatever it is in your household, whether it's walking the, walking the dogs or- <laughs> raising the kids transparency thank you yeah. yep creating Honesty. a safe space creating a safe space making it right slowing down and taking time i feel like um all of us are so busy mm -hmm. like one thing that uh we did we we did we used to do when our kid i have twin daughters my mm -hmm. first my first and only pregnant no it wasn't my own my first and only pregnancy with children yes i had twins Mm -hmm. So I was an old first time mommy and working full time and my partner working full time. And we borrowed a tradition from a Jewish tradition in the marriage ceremony when right after you get married, like right after you're married and you walk down the aisle before you go with the rest of the family for a party to mm -hmm. the party, mm -hmm. you step into a space, a room, mm -hmm. where it's just the two of you and you yep. break bread you have a little bread, you have a little bit of wine, you just have like 10 minutes where you just sit in the quiet and like take in the moment. Yeah. And it's called Yehud in Hebrew. And I, we said when the kids were really little, we need a, let's just go for five. We need a five minute Yehud <laughs> when we get home. I hear you. Even if the kids are all sitting at our feet, let's just sit on the sofa for five yeah. minutes before yeah. we cook dinner, before yeah. we do this, before yeah. we do that, yep. just five minutes yeah. and yeah. Um, <laughs> whatever comes up, comes up, but we're just still and together. Five minutes. Five minutes. Yeah. And um, I think that that was a good habit for us. And that kind of yeah. led to, we went through a long period where we like, we've got to promise each other that we go on a date. Yeah. Once a week. That's right. Which might have just been a walk in the park, but like I had to arrange somebody to be with the twins. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. just just doing that. So I think, you know, you all have the values. I think it's like mm -hmm. I, I think it's like making that time for each other. Each other, yes. Yeah. Making that time for each other and yourself and yourself and not feeling the pressure that your partner has to be your everything. No. Right, girlfriends, yeah. other yeah. friends. That's what we talked about last night. Yes, yeah. have some time with your friends, have a relationship outside the relationship. It's yeah. healthy. You let him have his me time too with his friends, and yes. then have time together. 
That's a healthy relationship. Prevention is always better uh -huh. than cure. I talking, know. talking, talking. That's right. Yeah. We talking, need to talking, learn talking. what a healthy relationship looks like. Yes, definitely. Children yes. need to see that in yeah. the household, you know, like a mom and dad needs to show the children, you know, what healthy relationship looks like and not only to tell them, but just to show, you know, yeah. So we decided like at uh, different points in our relationship, we got to be kind of a joke. But, you know, if we were both over the edge or if I felt like my partner was like getting a little too uptight with the kids, vice versa, yeah. Yeah. we had a code word. We would say it's snowing. Yeah. And sometimes I'd say, I don't care if it's snowing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I still want to make my point. <laughs> but most of the time, if he said, you know, I think it's snowing, Lee, I would be like, oh, oh let me go it. look out the window. Okay. okay, I'll go look out the window and I'll be back in a few minutes, girls. <laughs> so most of the time, snowing worked. We had to change the word. I got tired of snowing. Yeah. But most of the time it worked. Um, but, you know, just a way to like help each other out to be like, you know, yeah. let's be on the same side about some of this stuff let's yeah. be together yeah. i've been in this relationship 30 years yeah so it it has had it's you know it has growing its pains yes growing pains. Oh, i know that one mm. so like just really getting that um let's try to do it together yes um and that uh, that there are times when you know we just need that yahood still yes yep stay still yeah. just you and me in the bus while the kids are done here and I'm a big fan of um, therapy, whether it's oh. individual or couples. I always say like everybody could use a tune up every once in a while. Oh, I love therapy. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I'm a big fan of that, too, for perspective and help. But yes, I therapy. think you all said lovely things. Yes, they did. The girls yeah. Did job. And, you know, you can tell me if we ever meet again what your code word is if it's not snowing. Oh, my code word. I, have, I don't have a code word. Do you word, have a code but... word? I don't have a core word, but I have a look. We you have a look. look. We have a look. <laughs> look. If I give Omar this look and he gives me this look, that means it's like. Mm, mm, mm. We need a timeout. Need, need a timeout. Time yes. That's just. Mommy needs a timeout. She needs timeout. It's like, mm, no, I'm out. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's just that look. That's, that's it. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> And sometimes you still have that point to make. <laughs> yeah, I, no, sometimes I still go with my, my point. So I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. I'm keep yeah. going. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Oh, this It's was been fun. lovely talking with you all. It's nice not talking to you too. And, and, and Leah, it's, it's nice. It's, it's yeah. Nice. Ladies, uh, today we went over them. Oh, look at that. It's all six. Oh, yeah. You all must be such wonder. You all are seem like such wonderful, loving people friends and yeah, people in your people's lives everyone's okay. lucky to have you oh thank you leah i'm so lucky to have you too as my circle as of course mm -hmm. yeah i can't believe somebody hacked your facebook damn yeah i know yeah thank you thank you thank you very much everybody this was amazing conversation so have a great great rest of the afternoon and try to join yourself and do something nice for yourself i'm all good about it do yes, it. getting that sun. Yeah, getting that sun. I'm not going to go back to the sun. <laughs> put your feet up. I'm going to put my feet up and I'm going to eat ice cream before the kids get home. So, yes. Perfect. <laughs> Bye, guys. Thank you, Leah. Bye. -bye. Thank you so much, Leah. Yes. Okay. Bye, nice to meet you all. Thank Cheers. you, Leah.